Um, I started in 1960 um, at a technical school at MIT, um, graduate school. And at that time, as graduate students, what I recollect is that we thought we were on the, uh, the frontier of economic knowledge. And consequently, we were granted the key uh, to economic well-being. It was rather a heady idea, arrogant as well. Um, what we were learning there, what was so important to us, and which held the key to economic well-being, was this neoclassical synthesis of Samuelson and Solow, uh, two most important uh, professors at that time at MIT. Basically, to sum it all up, state intervention could get us to the production possibility frontier and keep us there. That's Samuelson. And then Solow it pushes out over time uh, economic growth, and then the Neoclassical theory, or the logic of neoclassical theory, tells us where you end up on the frontier. Powerful um, idea. And all other understandings at that time were dismissed, as far as I recollect. Uh, they were criticized. The most important at that time being the Chicago economics, um, which at that time was led by uh, Milton Friedman. No one ever said, uh, people were polite, no one ever said that Friedman and his radical ideas uh, so I'm not sure where he goes on the blackboard, but he was a radical at the time. Radical ideas were taken, no one, no one said that he was not to be taken seriously, uh, but his dismissal was part of the intellectual air that we breathed. Okay? Not my story. My short story. Um, around, I can't remember exactly, about 1962, Milton Friedman comes to Cambridge, USA, uh, and he gives a lecture at Boston College. Was, from what I remember, he didn't give one at Harvard. And I know he didn't give one at MIT. He went to BC uh, in Chestnut Hill. And a few of us, as graduate students, wanted to hear this radical because he was not part of our curriculum. He was dismissed. So we got out of the streetcar. We went up to Lake Street, um, the end of the streetcar line. We walked up the hill uh, to, to BC. And we walked in one of the, the classrooms, sat down um, to listen to Milton Friedman. Um, and for his attack at the time, which was an attack on the neoclassical synthesis, that we were learning um, at MIT from Samuelson and Solow and others. And I, I recollect I was kind of blown away at the time. His, his uh, critique was logical and it was persuasive. And I came away with the feeling at that time that his work should have been part of the MIT curriculum, and it wasn't. That's my first story for you. Okay, I'm going to continue on this thing. Um, a couple of years later, I think it was 62, but I'm not sure, but... Uh, Joan Robinson um, traveled from Cambridge, UK, to Cambridge, uh, USA, and she gave two lectures. The first one was at, at Harvard, um, and the second one was at uh, MIT, Up River, Down River. And she started each lecture, I remember this, with the question, what is capital? Um, and thus started the famous Cambridge controversy, which has a uh, history before this um, in the literature, but that, that was a very famous uh, uh, or very well-known moment. And I just would add to that, Joan Robinson's critique um, of neoclassical theory, What is Capital, uh, Sarafa's book, um, which was, I think, published in 1960, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. And that book, this is just a footnote, if you look at that book, that's less than 100 pages. It's a remarkable book done in just a few pages. A couple of days, here's my story, second story. A couple of days after listening to uh, Joan Robinson, we went to Harvard and we heard her at MIT, a uh, number of graduate students. We asked a professor of ours who was teaching us a course in mathematical economics, a, a young guy, terrific teacher, later on is going to become a well-known economist, what's it all about? You know, what, is, what is this all about? And, and what are the consequences? It, it was very difficult to figure out what she was saying because she used no mathematics. Think about that. And he said to us the following. He said to ignore her critique because she didn't understand mathematics. And were she to understand it, she would never make that critique. There is the power of mathematics to determine what is and what is not valid. Her, her critique, her criticism, at that time was dismissed by, by, by this uh, professor. Several years later, that same individual published two papers, fairly mathematical, in which he basically ac accepted her critique of the production part of neoclassical theory. Once, you know, 
what was once disputed and rejected became at a different moment valid, and all traces of that dispute kind of disappeared. And that's what's called, I like to call that, an epistemological moment um, in terms of this story. Okay? What was a truth, what was a non-truth at one moment becomes true, not too much longer, in this case by the same individual. About eight years later, um, after this, uh, so it was in the early 70s, 70, 70, 71, I'm sitting with a colleague of mine, a uh, co-author of mine, and a good friend named Steve Heimer, unfortunately passed away. And we're sitting in my university office um, at a different uh, uh, institution in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And we're working on an article uh, that we were asked to write in honor of a former teacher of ours, uh, Charlie Kindleberger, who taught international trade at MIT. And we were, fi we were, it was difficult how to connect the class theme of the paper that we were writing, uh, Heimer and myself, to what we had studied at MIT, um, including uh, Kindleberger's trade course. We couldn't see the connection, but we had to make a connection because we, we thought it was a good way, you know, what's the connection between what we're doing now and what Charlie was teaching us? So Heimer says, let me tell you a story and see if it makes, uh, uh, provides a connection. And here's Heimer's story. Um, so Stephen walks into Samuelson's office and he asks the following question of Samuelson. What is there in Marx that is valid and not included in the MIT curriculum? And Samuelson, as he always did, he answered very, very quickly, class struggle. You, you, you got that. Okay. Marx is part of the curriculum here at, at UMAR, UMass. As far as I know, unless things have changed, he's never been part of that curriculum at MIT. Okay. Next story. Around 72, 73, I get on a mission, ILO, UN mission to, to the Philippines. And the job of the mission was to come up with a development plan um, for that particular country. And, and I had studied, um, although I really wasn't a development economist, but I had studied um, a good deal of economic uh, development and was beginning to make you know, a contribution to that field. And, and the field at that time was very concerned with these uh, two-sector development models, agriculture and industry, and how they interact. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And much of the literature at that time um, stressed the deep structural, economic and non-economic, both barriers and therefore the problems that faced the agricultural and the industrial sectors. That was the truth of the day. These barriers were preventing economic development. And from the left, the barriers also included um, capitalist countries themselves that had underdeveloped the third world. That's the Gunda Frank and uh, Samir Amin uh, thesis. I recall then, this is the story, I recall in the middle of this mission, um, the ideas being discussed by the economists there and the policies being put forward had just about nothing to do with anything that I had studied at the time. Nothing to do with, uh, for example, the Lewis, Faye, Reynas uh, models of, of development. Nothing to do with Gunda Frank and Samir Amin. And it was very unnerving for me. Um, it was as if I was in a different economic universe. Um, and, and so I, I, I didn't know quite what to do. I had to come up with something as part of my contribution to this mission. And I had to figure out what the hell was going on um, in this discussion. And what I figured out was that a new paradigm was being created within economic development, which was this, I don't know what you want to call it, the new micro-foundations of macroeconomics. It was the use and application of applied micro-theory to economic development. Well, as a member of the mission, I argued against this. I didn't like where it was. I didn't like it. Um, I didn't like the uh, policies that were being put forward. And the basic policies, you all know these now, was the liberalization program um, for the Philippines, which was going to be all over the third world, which is higher interest rates, elimination, of course, of tariffs, reduced power of unions, reduced corporate taxes, and so forth. You know all this. Uh, the liberalization, by the way, this, this so-called uh, Reagan and Thatcher policies started first in the third world. It was imported or exported back to the first world. Later on, in a dinner um, honoring in the Philippines the uh, members of this UN ILO mission, a fairly well-known economist, well-known at the time, uh, was sitting next to me. Um, and he had, in the mission, attacked me for my uh, uh, views that he claimed um, were not only outdated, uh, but were dangerous. 
because I had been arguing for these barriers, including uh, how capitalism was underdeveloped, had underdeveloped the Philippines. And so uh, he's sitting next to me, and he had a, one too many drinks, and he whispered in my ear um, the following. He said, Steve, I really like you, which is very nice. <laughs> he said, um, you have a good heart, but unfortunately a bad brain. Uh, so my perspective, if you want my truth, that the pr proposed liberalization program wouldn't help the majority of that population, and it never did, um, who were desperately poor, was a product of my passion, coupled with a low IQ. That's how I was dismissed at the time. Now, let me 